In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us here. Lord, we just ask for your grace to, uh, to be with us, to lead us, to guide us, to bring us ever closer to you, no matter what is going on in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones. Lord, we love you, and we ask that you help us to love you in return. We say this all in Jesus' name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. So when you talk about um, no, so no soul left behind, we don't want to leave a soul behind. But what we have to remember is there's proper order to this, and we are not the final determiner of which souls get to go and which souls don't. Um, one thing we have to keep in mind when we're talking about friends and family who have left the faith is it's not up to us. Okay, we've got somebody bigger than us, better than us, stronger than us. We've got our good and gracious Lord. That doesn't mean we don't have a part. We just want to make sure we're doing the right part and doing it the right way. Because if we're doing the wrong thing, if, even if we're doing it the right way, it's probably not going to come out all that well. And if we do the right thing in the wrong way, it doesn't work either. So we want to make sure we're doing proper order here. So let's talk about, um, just give you a quick overview of stuff. First thing we want to talk about is our mission and our motive. What is our mission? What is it we're supposed to be doing? Why are we supposed to be doing it? Next, we'll briefly talk about the three sources of evil. And the reason why I want to talk about this now, as opposed to in the later talk when we're talking about spiritual warfare, is because there's a reason why people have left the faith. And it's not because of an excuse that they have given, it's because of the three sources of evil. If we understand where evil comes from, we'll understand who they are battling and who, in a sense, we are battling against for them. Then we'll talk about the devil's strategy. Very simple, we're just gonna go over this very quickly but just so you have enough information so you'll know best how to pray. Specific lessons from Our Lady, four virtues from Our Lady that we can imitate and we can make use of to help us in our own spiritual life, but also help others in their spiritual life. Preparing to pray, very simple message about that. And then finally, four simple steps to reclaiming those lost souls. Four simple steps, and it's going to be very simple because if we make it complicated, it's probably not of God. It's got to be very simple. It's got to be part of his economy of salvation, part of his plan for us. So do four simple steps to bring back those lost souls sound good to you? Yes or no? Yes. All right. Well, praise God. That's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're, we are, where we will end up. Let's talk about our mission and motive from the catechism. Reborn as sons of God, the baptized must profess men, must profess before men the faith they have received from God through the church and participate in the apostolic and missionary activity of the people of God. That's our job, that's our mission, that's what we're supposed to do, that's us. In this plan, in this prayer time of praying for them, this is us. This isn't them right now, right? Because they're not part of that church. They are, they just don't know it. But they're not, they're not part of that church. So this is our mission, and then next comes our motive. We have to live this mission in, in all we do and say, if we truly want to be Catholic, if like Gregory was saying, if they fully sold out, if you or I have fully sold out, we will live this mission. Not perfectly. That's not going to happen on this side. But we're going to do our best to live that mission. So our mission, our job, is to sell the faith. One of the books that I, I have is, is called uh, Christ-Centered Selling. And it talks about selling um, in the real world but it's also used in terms of um, evangelization and things like that. Um, but very often when I'm speaking to a group about Christ-centered selling, I will say to them, and I'll say to you, I'll ask you a question. How many of you here are salespeople? Raise your hand if you're a salesperson. Okay, just a few of you. Most people don't want to admit that, right? Oh, you know, I'm a salesperson. The hand goes up halfway. Let me ask you a question. How many of you are married? Raise your hand. You're a salesperson. <laughs> How many of you have children? You're the customer because you're always getting sold, right? <laughs> They're the salespeople. How many of you are baptized? You're a salesperson. You've got to be selling the faith. Selling, which, and, and not the used car salesman type of selling the faith, but you've got to be living that faith. You've got to be loving that faith. So people come up to you. You know the easiest way to sell somebody is when they come up to you and say, I want what you got. Then you don't have to sell. And if we live our faith the way we're supposed to live our faith, people will come up to us, what do you got? 
Why are you so happy? You've got this light coming off of you. You've got this happiness. I, I want some of that. That's the best way to sell. One quick sales lesson and we'll move on. If I were in front of a group of real, you know, out real world salespeople and I only had one minute with them, I would say this to them. You're either convicted or you're conflicted. When it comes to your, sale, your selling, your sales, you're either conflicted about your product and your process and your service or you're convicted. If you're conflicted, eh, you're not gonna sell. If you're convicted, you will. If nothing else, they will believe that you believe. And that's what we have to be about our faith. We have to be absolutely convicted. Because if we are convicted, they will be convicted. All right, next. The motive for the love of Christ impels us, moves us forward. It's for the love of Christ. If we're doing this for any other reason, it's not going to work out so well. It's got to be for the love of Christ. If we're doing this for our own prideful motives, and that does enter into it, if we're honest with ourselves, it's not going to work as well. It's not as pure. And if it's not as pure, it's not as of God, which means it's not going to be as effective in bringing them back to the church. For the love of Christ, let's keep that in mind when we talk about all this. All right, the three sources of evil. I'm just give them to you real quick. The world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the formulation from St. Thomas Aquinas. Those are the three sources of evil. Uh, Peter Kreeft had a, had a great, great quote in one of his books. He said, uh, were it not for the devil, the world and the flesh would not be a problem. Right? So we understand the devil's behind this, but at the same time, we can't just blame the devil, be like you know, Flip Wilson from the 1960s, the devil made me do it kind of thing. Uh, we have to take our own responsibility. But let's just talk a little bit about each one. From Padre Pio, what are the world, the devil, the flesh, and all our enemies before the Lord? Despite the fact that those are the three enemies, they're nothing compared to our God. So we need to keep that in mind. Let's talk about the world. Truth and love has clearly been flipped upside down in the world that we live in. We don't need to go through all the, the list of craziness, just even in the past 10 years, forget the past 100. I mean, it's just unbelievable. And we sit here, we sit here and accept it. Oh, you might spout off about it to your wife or on a Facebook post or something, or you, know, you probably can't do that too many times or they'll flag you and, and delete your account. But in the world we live in, it's upside down. We know this. The world sets a bad example. And so our children, our grandchildren, our spouses, our friends are absorbed, as are we, we're absorbing what the world is giving us. And if we don't have God's grace and if we're not willing to fight back enough, it's going to, in a sense, overtake us. The world is very, very powerful. So the collective bad example of us, of the world, is one of the sources of evil and one of the ways that our children and grandchildren and loved ones have left the faith because of what the world has done to them. St. Catherine of Siena, the world is opposed to God and God to the world. They have nothing in common. This is really important to understand. We, we know God created the world, but since evil has entered, there is nothing in and of the world that is of God. We can try to redeem that world, bring a greater good out of it, but the world is directly opposed to God. The world says we don't need God. The world seeks glory, honor, pleasure, pride, freedom from suffering, avarice, hatred, resentment, and such small-hearted self-centeredness. I think we all, we'll all agree. I don't think, you know, preaching to the choir, right? Um, something interesting about preaching to the choir, though, some, sometimes people will say, well, you know, you're just kind of preaching to the choir. Well, if the choir is the only one who shows up, that's who you have to preach to, <laughs> right? And hopefully what we do is stir up the choir enough that they get angry out of love for Christ, and they go out into the world, and they be Christ to the world. That's the world. Let's talk about the flesh. Here's from St. Teresa of Avila. Our body, ha our body has this defect that the more it has provided care and comfort, the more it needs and desires it finds. You ever notice that? The more comfortable we, we kind of become, the more we want more comfort. That's the weakness of the flesh. 
The more we have a certain sin, the more we participate in a certain sin, especially sins of the flesh, the more we want more of those sins of the flesh. That's the weakness of the body. The body is weak. Most people, and it's changing. I would say five years ago, this was an absolutely true statement, is that most of the people that left the church left because they did not agree with the church's sexual moral teaching, one rule, one uh, teaching or the other. That's changing now because now we're, we're leaving a kind of a Christian or a post-Christian society and where we've entered into um, really an atheistic society where people don't believe in God. Again, 15 years ago, when we were talking about apologetics, it was always about Christian versus Christian, you know, Protestant view versus the Catholic view. Now it's about the no God view versus the God view. We've got to defend that position now. Your God doesn't exist. Prove it. Right? Before that wasn't even an issue. It was basically a Christian culture with differences and distinctions, yes, but it was a Christian culture. Now, not so much. The kids are, are, are very, our young ones are, are very well educated. Um, that's probably the wrong way to say it. They have learned the wrong stuff very well. And it's amazing what happens when they go away to college even Catholic colleges. It's amazing when, what happens when they go to schools, to public schools. You know, if government runs our schools, be assured that the kids are going to learn about how great the government is. And the government's ultimate job, or its, its ultimate goal, is to replace God. If you don't think it is, you're lying to yourself. That's not its purpose in our Constitution, certainly, but that's its purpose. That's the natural end of a government that'll take over and starts taking over parts of our lives, is that it becomes the God. Um, here's the quote that Gregory referenced. It says, all the strength of Satan's reign is due to blank. Now, he kind of gave it away, so it's not as fun. But I was going to ask you, what, what is it? What's the answer there? All the strength of Satan's reign is due to the easygoing weakness of Catholics. It's our fault. Don't look at anybody else. It's us. If we ever lived our faith the way we're supposed to live our faith, this world would be different. Think of it this way. Remember those, those fairs we used to have, and maybe you still do around here, um, like those country fairs, and you have all the games, and you have the, uh, the rides, and you have the Ferris wheel? Well, the Catholic Church is the Ferris wheel. It's the ride everybody else wants to be. It's the ride all the other rides hope they grow up to be when they get that chance. It's the one ride you can see from miles away. Everybody wants to be on it. Everyone knows it's the ride. Everybody does. They don't want to join it. It's too hard. They don't want to admit it, but they know. Why else are so many other places trying to show how they are not Catholic instead of showing who they are? Why is the world fighting against us so much in terms of life and so many issues? We're the Ferris wheel. Everybody knows it. The devil. From St. Peter, be sober and vigilant for your adversary. The devil is like a roaring lion traveling around and seeking those whom he might devour. The devil is a source of evil. The devil is real. We'll talk about that later in the spiritual warfare talk. My guess is you already know that. That's why you're here. But he is real. And he will do anything and everything he can to steal the life of grace in your soul and the souls of those whom you love. And we're here to steal it back. St. Jerome, the world is the power, the world is in the power of the evil one. So again, we want to know who's pushing buttons here. We want to know who is drawing our loved ones away from the faith. Yes, their free will is engaged, and it, ultimately it's on them. But if we can break down the powers that are pulling them, if we can cut those cords, we at least give them a chance to fight back, to make it a fair fight, if you will. And it's not a fair fight because God's on our side, God's on their side. So it's never a fair fight. It's always an unfair fight in a good way for us. But still, we want to make sure we give that, that soul every chance we can. From Pope Francis's latest document, look what he says. He basically covers all these points in, in this um, one little paragraph. We are not deal dealing merely with a battle against the world and a worldly mentality that would deceive us. 
and leave us dull and mediocre, lacking in enthusiasm and joy. Nor can this battle be reduced to the struggle against our human weaknesses and proclivities. It is also a constant struggle against the devil, the prince of evil. Say what you will about Pope Francis, and I know there have been some issues and maybe some communication errors, but the man does believe in the devil, and he speaks of that often. And praise God, because the devil is real. And sometimes when I'm talking about spiritual warfare, people are like, you know, why are you talking about the devil so much? It's because we don't talk about him enough. In our church, in this world, in, in the last 50 years, we don't talk about him. We've become the church of nice. And we have to realize we have an enemy who is looking to kill us. Don't you think we should know who the enemy is and what his strengths are and what his weaknesses are? Yes. We'll talk more about that. Let's talk about his strategy. Very simple. Toehold, foothold, stronghold. The devil doesn't start to get you by going to the highest level and just showing all of his strength and trying to kill you because most of us would flee. Almost every one of us would turn around and run away. So what he does is he does a process called toehold, foothold, stronghold. He starts to get just a little toehold. And then with time, it's a foothold. Gets you a little bit more, holds onto you a little bit tighter. And then it becomes a stronghold. The reason why this is important to know is because there's little things that will be happening in these people's lives that start to have them drift away from the church. And if we stop or catch it, then it's a lot easier to deal with. If it's a toehold, we can deal with it. We can help. We can pray against that. We can talk to them probably. But if it's a stronghold, it's a lot harder. And that's why we want to catch this as early as we can. Interesting to note about this is this is the exact same strategy God uses. Now, God used it first and best, and the devil doesn't have an original idea, so all he can do is ape what God does. But this is how God speaks to us, very softly and gently, and gets us to go to step one, and then step two, and then step three, and then he's got us in a good way. So it's that same strategy, and it's that same strategy that we might want to consider using with them. Instead of coming at them, you know, with, with guns blazing, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, full barrel guns blazing and going after them, maybe we need to take this strategy, a toehold, a foothold, and then a stronghold, all for God. From Aquinas, excuse me. The devil doesn't immediately tempt a spiritual person to grave sins, but begins little by little with lighter sins, so as to lead him shortly to more serious sins. That's the evil one strategy. It's a process, and it is reversible. We can do something about it. All right, let's get to the heart of what we want to talk about. That was kind of the intro piece. Let's get to the heart of it. Lessons from Our Lady. Four virtues of Our Lady. That if you look at her life, if you examine her life, if you pray ab about her life, I think you'll come across these four virtues in, um, frequently and in great measure. First one is humility. Our Lady was nothing if not humble. I'm going to give the four to you right now, and then we'll go back and talk about each of them. Second one is obedience. She was obedient. Third, surrender. Our Lady surrendered. And fourth is trust. Now, if you look at those four words, do you see anything up there? There you go. What a great acronym, great acronym, great way to remember the four virtues of Our Lady. Humility, obedience, surrender, and trust. And what a great acronym for us as we go down the communion aisle to receive communion. And if we say to our Lord, Lord, help me to be humble. Help me to be obedient. Help me to surrender. Help me to trust. Just like Our Lady. Humility, obedience, surrender, and trust. Let's talk about humility. The most powerful weapon to conquer the devil is humility, for as he does not know at all how to employ it, neither does he know how to defend himself from it. Our Lady was humble. She was incredibly humble. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says, humility is truth. 
Once we know who we are, truly who we are, we'll be humble. Because if we ever think of who we are as compared to who he is, there's no comparison. We owe our entire existence to him. His words to St. Catherine of Siena, St. Catherine of Siena, doctor of the church, Catherine of Siena. I am he who is, you are she who is not. If he says that to her, what does he say to us? He says the exact same thing. I am he who is. You are the one who's not. In other words, I'm God, you're not. Let's get that, let's get this proper order. Stop trying to control everything. Be humble. Our Lady's humility, the lowness of her humility was the height of her greatness. Because of her humility, God was able to use her. So in terms of thinking about reclaiming the lost souls, in terms of being that type of Christian who is not lukewarm, who is not easygoing in the faith, the first virtue is humility. Lord, help me to be humble. Help me to be humble in you, Lord. Let not this relationship, let it not bring out pride in me. Let me not be prideful about this. Let me not be hurt about this in a prideful way. Let me be humble. Let me be humble like you, your, your mother was. Help me to be humble in, in all the travails that come. This is the first and foundational virtue for all of us. It's humility. Next up is obedience. <clears throat> Again, from Catherine of Siena, the soul who possesses charity never falls into pain or distressing sadness, nor does she argue with obedience. No, she is obedient even to the point of death. Does that sound familiar? It's from Scripture talking about our Lord. We are to be obedient even to the point of death, martyrdom. And I think most of us, if we were faced with a true martyrdom situation where someone said to you, deny your God or I will kill you, I doubt any of us would really buckle. But you know what? That's not really that big of a deal. What's a bigger deal is not so much dying for God, but living for him day after day after day. That is a whole lot harder. Take me now, Lord. It'd be nice and easy, right? Get it over with. I'm gone. I'm good. I'm in heaven. But he's saying, no, that's not for you. What's for you is, is loving me, living this life day after day after day and struggling through it that way. That's the harder death to be obedient to that. So we've got the humility, we've got obedience. One of the things to keep in mind about obedience is blessings follow obedience. When we're obedient, even if it doesn't make sense to us, even if we don't want to be to the, in this particular moment, even if we'd like to do something different, when we are obedient, blessings will follow obedience. By the way, demons follow disobedience. So your choice, blessings or demons, which would you rather? Let's be obedient. We'll talk more about obedience when we're talking about spiritual warfare. There's a whole list of obedience things to, we need to be obedient to, and people we need to be obedient to. But for now, it's think about Our Lady and how she was obedient. In fact, going back to St. Catherine of Siena real quick, St. Catherine of Siena said that if Our Lord needed, Our Lady would have made a ladder out of her body so he can climb up on the cross. Because she knew that's what he had to do. That's not normal for a mother to do. But yet Our Lady was willing to do that if that's what it took to make sure that he too was obedient. After that comes the surrender. <clears throat> St. Therese, one is consumed by love to the extent one is surrendered to love. All this is going to come into play, and there's a, there's a concept I'll introduce now. We'll talk about it more today and also in the second talk. What God permits, 
he can redeem. What God permits, he can redeem. Think about that for a second. What God permits, whatever he permits, he can redeem. Redeem, make something better out of it. What God permits, he can redeem. Is that true, yes or no? Are you sure about that? Think about it, let's break it down. What he permits, does anything happen outside of God's permission? A little divided there. Has anything happened outside of God's permission? Yes or no? No. If it did, he's not God. That's not saying he wanted it to happen, but he permitted it. Okay? So what God permits, he can redeem. Is there anything that can happen that God cannot redeem, bring a greater good out of? No. If there were, he wouldn't be God. So what God permits, he can redeem. So has God permitted this person to walk away from the faith? Yes or no? Yes, he has. Can he redeem it? Yes or no? Yes, he can. Will he redeem it? We don't know. He wants to. We certainly want him to. He really, really wants to. And that's kind of why we're here. So please understand, a greater good can come from this than ever would have come from it if it had not happened. Thinking, well, how's that true? Just think of the crucifixion. Look at all the good that came from that event. God permitted it. He redeemed it. And he will redeem this situation as well. I believe that. What God permits, he can redeem. Sometimes the surrender is an imitation of Our Lady. I stay with the Mother of God at the foot of the cross. Then it is always a joy and an honor for me to suffer for God. St. Jean de Lestinac. Sometimes all we can do is just hang out at the cross and just be there. You know, in Jesus' uh, last words from the cross, one of them was when he was speaking to St. John. He said, you know, son, there is your mother. Mother, there is your son. Uh, woman, actually, excuse me, he says woman. Woman, there is your son. And... Um, one of the commentaries I had read about it is the reason why Jesus says the word woman and not mother is because he doesn't want any comfort on the cross. He doesn't want that love, that comfort, because he's dying. He's taking all of our sins. He wants all of the ugliness, all of the anger, all of that stuff with no comfort. He surrendered completely. He didn't even want an ounce of it. And so what could Our Lady do? Just be there. And sometimes with our children and our grandchildren, that's the best thing you can do. In fact, I would say nine times out of ten, shut up and just be there. Let them know you love them. That doesn't mean you just let them go off the cliff. I'm not saying that at all. But more often than not, yelling at them is going to drive them off the cliff. And that's our pride that comes out. Last one down here is trust. From St. Paul of the Cross, the easiest way to keep your peace of heart is to accept everything as coming directly from the hands of God who loves you. If you do this, any pain or persecution, anything which is difficult to accept will be transformed into a source of joy, happiness, and peace. Think about that. If we took every sickness Every job firing, every um, angry fight, every, everything that ever happened to us that was ugly and wrong and bad, if we took it as coming directly from the hands of God, how much more peace would we have in our life? It's not to say it's going to be easy. Pick up your cross and follow me. That's part of our faith. This isn't Joel Osteen. We believe in a faith that suffers and suffers with a purpose. Do you know truly Catholic Christianity, if you look at in the annals of religion, Catholic Christianity is the only faith, I'll include Orthodox Christianity in that, or the, is the only faith that understands and, and, can, and can make sense of suffering. Nobody else can. Not Judaism, they don't understand it. Not evangelicalism, not Protestantism, because they've given that away. They've tried to remove the suffering from the process. Yet the suffering is our salvation. It's the only one that makes the sense of that. Because it's the truth. We've got to trust. A few years back, 
say, gosh, probably about 12 years ago, um, my family and I went through the largest crisis we've ever been through, and it was horrible. And it was, it was an extended period of time, and uh, you're just like, God, where are you? What's going on? All that stuff. And I remember having this conversation with him for about a year and a half, and I finally got an answer. I, any, does anybody ever hear from God when they, when they pray? I, we get one person in the room, come on, people, put your hands up. You better hear from God. I hope he's talking to you. I, well, he is talking to you. We just got to shut up and listen. And I don't mean he's going to sit down next to you and have this conversation. He'll speak to your heart. Sometimes you kind of hear it in your head. But don't think that's reserved for mystics or great saints. It's not, because I'm neither. It's for all of us. We're in relationship with him. Hearing from God is called prayer, because it's a two-way street. Anyway, so finally heard from God after all these years, and this is how the conversation went. Now, I'm very logical. I'm very, uh, very economical. Just get to the point. Don't waste a lot of time. Just come on, talk to me. And so God says this, am I God, yes or no? My answer was what? Yes. Since I'm God, did you pray to me, yes or no? Since I'm God and you prayed to me, did I hear you, yes or no? So what's your problem? God's honest truth. That's how the conversation went. I still don't have an answer. What's your problem? If I'm God, you prayed and I heard, what is your problem? I know. I get it. I understand they've left the church. I got this. You worrying about it is not helping either one of us. You screaming your head off is not, not working. You being moody, it's not working. I got this. Am I God? Did you pray? Did I hear? What's your problem? We've got to trust. We've got to trust our good and gracious God that he will bring about their conversion at that right moment. So preparing to pray. Before we pray, because we're going to do those four simple steps, remember? Yes? That's what this is about, the four simple steps. Before we get there, this is not about you. This is about them. Stop making it about you. I can't believe they did this to me. They left the church. This isn't about you. It's about them. Get over it. Were you perfect in your upbringing and your faith? Were you always there? Were you always on? Probably not. They're probably going down that same path. The world does that to us. The flesh will do that. The devil will do that. I'm not saying it's okay. But let's acknowledge, this isn't about you, this is about them. And let's do what's best for them, not what's best for you. Gathering in groups of four and grumbling about it's not helping either. Trying to figure out whose child is actually worse is not working. And it sounds like some of you are doing that. <laughs> this is not about you. Number two, it is not your job to convert. That's the Holy Spirit's job. It may be your job to have a conversation, but it is not your job to convert, so stop trying to convert. If what I'm saying is true, isn't there a lot of freedom in that? You don't have to convert. All you have to do is maybe converse. And conversing doesn't necessarily mean talking with your words. It may just be with your actions. It may just be loving them. But it's not your job to convert. God's timing is perfect. And I know it's cliche, and I know we hear it a lot, but it's true. But I want it now. I know, so do I. But it's his timing, his way. Because, you know, if he brought them sooner, maybe it wouldn't stick. Maybe they were not ready for it. I had a friend of mine who um, was Catholic growing up, and um, he would ask me questions about the faith in terms of apologetics-type style questions, and I would answer them just, just enough. It would, I would only give him the answer to the question he asked. I would not go into any further detail. I would tr not try to lure him in or any of that stuff. Anyway, years later, he came back into the church, and um, I had written a book on... Uh, apologetics and about it was, it was called Catholic Truth for Catholic Teens and somehow he had gotten a hold of it 
and he read it and he said, oh my gosh, he goes, you could have just blown me away on day one with all of this stuff. And just, you know, boom, 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 just knocked everything out. I was like, what good would that have done? And, and by the way, me not doing that was only the grace of God because I think I really wanted to do that. But God's timing is perfect. If I had, if I had hit him with a shovel on day one, he'd probably be dead. Give it to them in, in the way they can handle it. Meet them where they're at. God's got this. Last one, what God permits, he can redeem. All right, so we talked about that. We ready for the four simple steps, yes or no? All right, I think we got two quotes first. Um, it cannot be that the son of these tears should be lost. That's Monica and Augustine, right, who we, we know about, we invoke. And we'll tell you a little bit, a little story that will add a little bit to that. Uh, from St. Claude, everything that happens to us in this life happens by the order or permission of a God who has always loved us and who loves us still more than we love ourselves. Again, what God permits, he can redeem. Last quote, and then we'll finish. In his will, our peace. That's where we want to be, in his will. Let's talk about the four simple steps. Oops. <laughs> Isn't that just like technology, right? You get into the to high point all of a sudden. It takes off. All right, four simple steps. Number one, love them where they're at. You got to love them where they're at. That doesn't mean you give in to them. You love them where they're at. Monica and Augustine, did you know who their bishop was? St. Ambrose. Isn't it nice to have a bishop who's a saint? Hopefully you guys do. Monica was complaining to Ambrose about Augustine. You can imagine what her complaints were. Legitimate, all. But she was grumbling. And so St. Ambrose says to St. Monica, and I say to you, talk less to Augustine about God, talk more to God about Augustine. Shut up. Talk to him. Stop talking to him. Talk to him about it. He's the one in control. He's the one that's got, knows what to do. Stop beating heads with your son. It's not working. Love them where they're at. The second part of this is um, last year I was speaking at an addiction conference and um, there were two men there from Chinakala, which is a, um, a Catholic recovery center. It's, it's actually a beautiful thing. Uh, but they kind of go away and they live on the land for years at a time and then hopefully return back to society. Um, and these two gentlemen had an incredible story. Um, and people just loved hearing their story. And, and when they were done talking, People gave him a round of applause and were so excited and, and so happy that they were there. And it was really beautiful to see. And then it, something struck me. Did we love them exactly the same when they were using drugs? Or did we just like the recovery story? Because if we weren't there to cheer them on or cheer them off, the drugs, if we weren't loving them that same way when they were using drugs, we really have no right to love them now. We're being hypocrites. Oh, we love the fact that you came back. No, we're supposed to love them where they're at. Love them right here, right now, in the midst of the ugliness. And I think sometimes, with, especially with our adult children, we're not loving them. Oh, of course we love them, but we're not loving them. We're not being loved to them. Love doesn't just accept. Love doesn't, it's, I'm not saying just, oh, just accept it. St. Teresa Benedict of the Cross says, do not accept anything as love which lacks truth. Do not accept anything as truth with la which lacks love. One without the other is a destructive lie. And Aquinas' definition of love was that it always seeks the good of the other. So we're always seeking the good of the other, but we've got to love them where they're at. Real quick, I wanted to, um, there's some lyrics from a song. And just so I don't forget, and I promise I will not sing them, um, I think it, it just kind of brings us home very quickly. It says, there's a park downtown where the homeless get ignored, where the church next door is a crowd singing, blessed are the poor, where the Mercedes drive away muttering druggies, drunks, and whores, where the bumper sticker displays, my co-pilot is the Lord. Let's not do that to our drug friends, our homeless friends, our friends who have left the faith. We need to love them where they're at. Never, ever, 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 ever give up on your children. Never, ever, ever. St. Dismas. Anybody know who St. Dismas is? He's the good thief. 
Fulton Sheen has said, said about St. Dismas is he remained a thief his entire life. He stole heaven with his last breath. I got a question for you. If your child stole heaven with their last breath, would you be okay with that? Yes or no? All right, so it may not be in your time. I'd rather have it happen now. I know that all of us would. But I don't really care as long as they get there. And I don't care how they get there. I don't care what method God uses as long as they get there. Oh, let's go to number three. Pray for the desire. It's a really simple point, but a very, very important point. Pray for the desire. We, my guess is we're praying for this person's conversion. Lord, give them a conversion, some version of that. Would that be a fair statement? Right? Lord, give them a conversion. So what I'm here to say to you is to stop praying for their conversion. Because they have made a free will decision on their own to not have a conversion. They said, nope, don't want anything to do with God. And God will respect that. In the battle between you desiring conversion for them and them saying no, God's going to respect their no. Now, does that mean we just give up? No, absolutely not. Just insert the word desire right before that. Lord, give them the desire for a conversion. Give them a desire for a conversion. Because why? Desire happens before the free will is engaged. Give them a desire to know you, to love you, to want to be with you. Give them a desire to participate in your church. Give them that desire. Incredibly powerful. Incredibly, just remember that one word. Add that word to your prayers. It's amazing what will happen. The last one down here is don't go it alone. If you'd like to see a miracle in your life, this is probably um, one of the ways you could you can get there. You can make it happen. There's lots of miracles. We have the Eucharist and, and you know, don't want to demean that. But this is a way we can bring about a miracle in our own lives. And it's very simply this. Don't ever go this process of praying for them, of praying for their desire for conversion. Don't do it alone. What do I mean by that? We've got the communion of saints on our side. One of our job as church, church militant is to pray for the church suffering in purgatory. So here's what you do. Only if you want your children to come back to the church. If you don't want them to, don't listen, don't do this. But if you do, you might want to consider doing it. And that is simply this. Ask our Lord to give you a soul in purgatory that you can pray for that is there because they too left the church. Lord, give me a soul in purgatory that I can pray for who's in purgatory because they left the church. And Lord, let me pray for that soul. You can ask him for a name. You may or may not get one, but you can ask. And then you pray for that soul as if your very life depended upon it. Because it might. You pray for that soul with every ounce of your being. You offer up your prayers. You offer up your sufferings. You offer up everything. Your fasting, your almsgiving, your masses. You offer them up for that soul. Why? Because all that soul knows at this point is love. The souls in purgatory would rather stay in purgatory until the end of time to not have you ever go to purgatory because they love. They love, they love, they love. That's all they know how to do. They love, they love, they love. They're getting closer and closer to God. They are starting to see God as he is. They're, all they can do is love. Ask our Lord to give you that soul in purgatory to pray for. And in praying for that soul, you watch miracles happen in your life because they will pray for you and for your family. Does that make sense? It's one of the most powerful things you can do. So we're going to run through these again one last time. Love them where they're at. Uh, from G.K. Chesterton, a true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what's behind him. Do it out of the love of Christ. Never ever give up. Pray for the desire. And then last one is don't go it alone. Um, what I'd like to do in closing is this, is pray this prayer together. This is a prayer that I pray every night, and I would offer it up to you as well. It, it encompasses all four things that we just talked about. 
So are you, you willing to do that? Yes? And this is for you and your, that special person that you're praying for. All right, so let's do this. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. I pray for family and friends. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.